morning. <clears throat> Good morning. Welcome to Calvary Chapel Inland, De- Calvary Chapel Inland Devo 30. I'm Pastor Ruben. Thank you for joining us today. We stream live on Facebook every Monday, Wednesday, and Fridays. And today we will begin chapter 2 of Hebrews. So if you want to grab your Bible, open it up, get your cup of coffee, highlighter, join us in this chapter. It's an awesome chapter. So much in it that... um, that I'm rejoicing at this moment on what Jesus Christ has truly done, done for us. So again, good morning. Glad you guys could join us. You're down the street. Well, get down here then. We need we need some chairs to be uh, filled here, Diane. <clears throat> I don't know where everyone else is, but the Lord does. Good morning, Patty. Thank you for joining us, Randy. Let's go ahead and pray, and we'll get started. Gracious Father, we thank you, Lord, for this opportunity, Lord, just to begin our day, Father, with you, Lord. Wow. Lord, those that uh, don't know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, uh, they really don't understand what it means to have a personal relationship with Jesus, Lord. I can try to describe that as much as I can, and they just won't get it. Uh, I like Chuck's analogy <clears throat> uh, that he uses quite often about not understanding things. I, I could be licking on an ice cream, and it could be some great flavor that I found somewhere, and I could just be licking it and licking it and just going, mmm, this tastes so good, it's just so creamy, it's so tasteful, the flavors just pop, and I can just describe it as much as I can. And people could be watching me and they could be thinking, you're crazy, how could that be so good? I've had ice cream before, it's not that great. And they just don't get it, not until they taste it. And then they'll understand what I'm talking about and how great it is. And so. It's true of Jesus Christ, Lord. Amen. Not until we taste him, Lord, will our lives reflect who he is, Lord. Truly, Lord. Because when we sin, when we fall short, Lord, uh, it is a lack of tasting Jesus, Lord. It is a reflection of our flesh, our carnal mentality, our narcissistic attitude, Father, of self-preservation, Lord. And when we know Jesus and love Jesus, Lord, and we realize how we need to, like Paul said, Lord, crucify the flesh, Lord, murder it, and allow Christ to live through us, Lord. And so it is Jesus in us, Father, that is good, and we just desire to be more like him, Father. So minister to us this morning, in Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen. Amen. Okay, oh, there you are. Okay, got it, you're at uh, Esther's house, yeah. Makes sense now. (laughs) All right, chapter two of Hebrews. So, uh, first verse begins with therefore, or you can say wherefore, or from where we came from. And so you have to go all the way back to chapter one and find out what uh, the writer of Hebrews wrote about Jesus Christ. And then you can begin the new uh, chapter here. And by the way, just so those of you that don't know this, uh, chapters and verses and even the names of, of these books uh, didn't come till later on after the writers had written these letters to the various churches. They wrote these letters and then they they took these letters and they transferred them over to different uh, communities and churches and they just kind of went all over the place. And a lot of copying was done and passing on of these letters and then it wasn't until <coughs> after... <clears throat> Uh, after the, when the church became so huge that they began to accumulate these letters and they agreed that they were canonical. In other words, they were uh, letters that God had written through men. And so the chapter b- uh, breaks uh, really weren't there in the past. Uh, we added them because it just makes it more simple for us to find things and also the verses too. In fact, if you look at some Greek, you'll find that uh, the Greek is written in little square boxes and they're close together. It's almost like uh, making a sentence and all the letters have no spaces at all between them. And it's just going on. Now we know the English language. We understand the English language. We read the English language. So if you had the English language all bunched up into uh, uh, lines, 
like the cat ran up on the roof, you know, if all of a sudden there was no spaces between those words, we'd still be able to read it, right? Because we understand English. We know the is T-H-E, and then there's, oh, there's cat, ran, you know, we would get that. And so with the Greek, if you understood Greek and read Greek, even though it's bunched up like that to us, it's like, wow, how could they read that? But they knew the words and they understand it. So it just helps us to, to find scriptures easier and turn there and teach from it. So verse one, therefore, we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. Uh, what the writer here is saying is the things that we have heard and read about Jesus Christ, we really need to pay a lot of attention to. <coughs> we need to make the effort to study, <coughs> to understand, and then to apply. Studying is good, and we should all be doing that. And there's nothing wrong with that, and there's <coughs> can be some good parts of that, but there can also be some bad parts. Because studying can lead to just head knowledge. And head knowledge isn't very good. It's just information that you have. Uh, if you don't understand the head knowledge that you have and you don't apply the head knowledge, then it's just knowledge and that's all it is. And people walk around with a lot of knowledge, you know, and especially Christians. Uh, they'll be very agreeable, especially on Sunday morning or when the scriptures are read. You know, they'll like, hallelujah, praise God, you know, thank you, Jesus, you know, and, and they're very agreeable with them. It reminds me of <laughs> Jeremiah, right? <clears throat> he would preach the word. The people are like, great message, Jeremiah, wonderful, great word. And then they walk away and they never did a thing with it. And that's the evidence of their salvation, is they really never did a thing with it. It wasn't that important that they wanted to change. <clears throat> there has to be change. There has to be a desire. And if there isn't, then you need to start in square one. Forgive me, Lord, because there's no desire here. And get on your knees and start praying and asking God for forgiveness and asking God to be a part of your life, fill you with the Holy Spirit and give you that desire to hunger not just for knowledge, but to hunger for application too. So he's saying, look, if you don't take this serious, if you don't earnestly heed the things uh, that we've heard and listened to and apply to your life, then you'll drift away. And drifting away means that you're going to back off. You're not going to be as an effective for the kingdom of God. Chuck would say, if you're not going forward, if you're not walking forward, uh, or I'm sorry, if you're walking backwards and you're not walking forward, right? <clears throat> and that's so true. How can you go forward if you're walking backwards? And there's a scripture that says, if you have your hands to the plow and you're looking back, you know, you're not fit for the kingdom of God because you're looking back. How can you plow when you're looking back at the world? How can you plow and make good straight furrows if you're looking at things behind you that you hunger and thirst and lust for? You just can't. And so you drift away, you fall back, you backslide is what the Bible says. And so you have to heed these things, otherwise the tendency is to fall away. And that is so subtle, like any sin, it just creeps in and, and it subtly settles in your thoughts and your minds and then you receive it and then you slowly back away. Next thing you know, it's like, how did I get into this place, into this situation? Well, it took a while, <clears throat> but it was slowly stepping away, not heeding the scriptures any longer. He goes on and says, For if the word spoken through angels proved steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a, dress, a, a just reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, uh, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard him? Uh, God also bearing witness both with signs and wonders, with various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. So if the angels themselves, as he said here in verse two, the angels uh, prove steadfast. Now we know that some angels did not and they fell away and they became the demonic beings that we see today. But if they were steadfast, and how shall we then escape if we neglect such a great salvation? Now chapter one was dealing with Christ and who he was and what he is going to do for us in our eternal state. In chapter 2, he is now building on that and saying what a great salvation it is through Jesus Christ. And really, that is the hope of every mankind, is that they come to know Jesus Christ personally. He's the only hope that we, we that any of us have. Like that young man who forgave uh, the police officer who, who had shot, who had shot uh, his brother. 
and in the courts and on television and news and so forth, he made this wonderful uh, plea of forgiveness uh, to her for what she had done, but also a plea to receive Jesus Christ as her Lord and Savior, because it's the only hope that she has, because she was sentenced to, I believe, nine years in jail, and he wanted a hug from her to let her know, I love you, Jesus loves you, please take a Bible, and from what I heard, the judge actually came down, gave her a hug also, and gave her her own personal Bible. This was a judge behind the court. So I thought that was just such a testimony of God's love and grace for an individual. Now, you might not be uh, on trial for murder or on trial for any crime, but we're all guilty, the Bible says. We all fall in short of the glory of God. We've all broken God's commandments. Let me, let me say this. Have you, ever, uh, have you ever told a lie? And what does that say? You're a liar. Have you ever stolen anything? Doesn't matter how big, how small it is. If you've stolen something, you're a thief. And those are only two commandments in the Old Testament. You've broken them. And according to the court of laws today in our land, if you break the law, you are to stand in judgment of what you've done. And you're to be fined or sentenced to jail. How much more would it be true in God's court if you've broken the commandments? And we haven't just broken two commandments, we've broken them all. Because the first commandments are talking about our relationship with God and idols. And we are to worship God above all things with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. We're to keep holy His Sabbath. We're to gather together in a public place with a bunch of believers, which is the church, and we're to worship Him, yet we don't do that. We're to keep holy that Sabbath day. We're not to take His name in vain, and yet how many times do we take God's name and we use it as a curse word? to curse other people that God loves and cares about deeply and we're taking his name and cursing them with that name. Uh, that is breaking of the laws and those are the commandments just dealing with God and then all the others <clears throat> very clearly. Now you might say, well, I've never committed adultery. The Bible says, uh, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, thy neighbor's good, thou shalt not steal. Um, you might say, I've never stolen anything but Jesus then came along in Matthew chapter 5 and said, look, it's deeper than that. Because the sin formulates within the heart. All sin stems from the heart. It's a matter of the heart and it's a heart issue. And how we see and view <clears throat> our life in this world and the things that we do. Is it in the heart? Do we do it with the heart? <clears throat> and so Jesus said, if you lust for a woman, you've committed adultery. Wow. Wow. So the intent in my heart is, is like doing the action itself because it's there. And given, up, given enough time, you probably will murder. You probably will steal. You probably will lie just given enough time because it's in your heart. So it's a heart issue. <clears throat> so our hearts need to be broken. They need to, uh, our heart needs to understand that we've broken God's commandments and that we're sinful and we deserve death. Now, if we break the law in this land, and we know this, it's logical, it makes sense. You run the stop, police officer pulls you over, he gives you a ticket, you go to court and you pay the fine. If you don't and you keep doing it, then your tickets pile up and they can take you and then you throw you in jail for 30 days. And they're justified in doing that. And you know that. So it's true of God too. If we just keep breaking and living uh, against God's law and rejecting him, then when we stand before him, he's gonna reject us and cast us into outer darkness. Or we can receive Jesus Christ, who is a great salvation. Such a great salvation through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Uh, and that's who the author is pointing to here in, in chapter 2. So he goes on now <clears throat> and talks about Christ, uh, who is superior uh, than all of humanity. Verse 5, for he has not put the world, not put the world to come, of which we speak in subjection <clears throat> to angels. <coughs> but one testified in a certain place saying, what is man that you are mindful of him or the son of man that you take care of him? You made him a little lower than the angels. You crown him with glory and honor and set him over the works of your hand. You have put all things in subjection under his Feet. So he has not put the world to come of which we speak in subjection to angels. Um, Jesus chose to be born into this world through humanity. 
Thus he became lower than the angels, yet being lower than the angels and being in like a man, he has all authority and power even over the angels because chapter one, he's God and he holds the scepter in his hand of authority. It says, for in that he put all in subjection under him. He left nothing that is not put under him. But now we do not yet see all things put under him. And ain't that the truth? I mean, do we see great things, uh, beautiful things in the world today? Yeah. Godly things, people treating and loving each other? Or do we see hate and crime all over and prejudice and, you know, all of these things going on? We see all that. Why? Because not all things have put, been put under him yet. It's coming in his future tense. Um, it's a future tense, and so that means it's going to come later on in the future. Uh, now's not the time, but our hope is that it will come one day when it will be all put under him. But we see Jesus, who is made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. Jesus. So, so Jesus became a man. And as a man, he tasted the things of this world. Doesn't mean that he um, fell into them or that he sinned, but he had a temptation of those things so that he can understand the things that we go through. Look at verse 10. For it was fitting for him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons to glory to make the author of their salvation perfect through suffering. For both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all of one, for which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren. So understanding these things that, that men have to suffer. They have to go through um, trials and tribulations and sufferings, and some more than others. Some suffer greatly and for long periods of, of time. We were just talking at a meeting and we were talking about some of the suffering that people suffer. And it's horrific and it's hard, but yet you see the faith that people have that have chronic illnesses. And I mean illnesses that they're in pain constantly, constantly in pain. There's not a, a minute or a second of the day that they're not in pain. You know, and that's that's this world. Um, and Christ understands that pain and that suffering. Paul understood that. That's why he suffered so greatly in so many areas of his life because Christ, when calling him, said, you must suffer many things for my sake. And that meant from every angle imaginable that came against Paul. And yet he could say that God's grace was sufficient. Paul always had an eye on the future, right? He always had an eye on eternal state. And that's why he probably said this, to be absent from the body is present with the Amen. Lord. It wasn't that he was necessarily saying, giving a truth, which is, it is truth, but he was saying in a sense was this body that is decaying and decrepit and pain, absent one day will be present with the Lord and it will be all over. And that was the hope that he had, you know, in Jesus Christ. So verse 11, for both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all of one, for which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare your name to my brethren. In the midst of the congregation, I will sing praise to you. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, here am I and the children whom God has given me. Then he closes up with, inasmuch then as the brother, as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shares in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil. Now I wanna just stop there for one second because this is, I believe, a proof, proof text for John chapter three, verse three, where Jesus is speaking to Nicodemus. You remember that? <clears throat> and he tells Nicodemus, you must be born again. That which is flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit, right? Mm -hmm. And there's always confusion in, uh, on the interpretation of that scripture. Well, this text here interprets it for us. Verse 14. Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of the flesh and blood. What is he talking about, flesh and blood? He's talking about that natural birth. He's talking about the natural birth that we're all born in. We've all partaken of that natural birth. 
and blood, the blood of Jesus Christ. He himself likewise shares the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil. <clears throat> so, so we see Jesus becoming a man, just like we became men and women. He was born of the flesh. So God came, laid his seed in the woman, that is Mary, who was a virgin, and she gave birth to God in the flesh. Emmanuel, right? Now, some might say, well, we, we have the power of uh, uh, today to, to uh, allow a virgin to have a baby. So it's not a miracle, you know, there. Well, the, the problem is, is that it is a miracle. <clears throat> because even though we might have the power to give a, a woman a seed so she can have a baby, we still have to inseminate her somehow. We have to use some tool somehow. We need to inject something somehow where God didn't need to do that. He just laid a seed in her, and there came Jesus Christ. That's the miracle itself. And don't forget that. Sometimes we try to minimize God's miracle by trying to understand them when the fact is a miracle is a miracle, and they're not easy to understand. And that is a miracle of God, the virgin birth of Christ. And he came forth in the flesh, you know, and walked among us, as it says, and released those who, through fear of death, were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For indeed, he does not give aid to angels, but he does give aid to the seed of Abraham. Isn't that cool? Yeah. <clears throat> he loves humanity. He loves humanity. <clears throat> and how we need to have that love for humanity. <clears throat> Romans, I think it's Romans 5 that talks about the Holy Spirit has shed abroad the love of God in our hearts, right? And so it's the love of God that's been shed in our hearts towards humanity. And there's just a love uh, for humanity that comes in that born again experience. When you realize what God has done for you and how much he has forgiven you, how much he has paid for your debt, <clears throat> and that he has given you eternal life, then there's an appreciation there, a true appreciation. <clears throat> and there will be a love for humanity. <clears throat> we're so self-centered that we think that we're above humanity or we're above other people and that we can treat them any way that we want. And that is so far from the truth. Uh, when we treat God's people a certain way, God's saying, you're treating me that way. And that's a scary thought to think about. Um, and so we need to be very careful how we treat our brothers and sisters, what we accuse them of, um, what we lie about them, um, how we slander their names and so forth, because we're doing that to Christ himself. <coughs> For God so loved the world, for God the Father so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. God loved the whole world and it's all the world, not just some of the world, not just the good ones <coughs> because there are no good ones. No, all the world God loved that he gave his son for everyone. So everyone has an opportunity to receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And so... The love that God has for humanity is the love that we should also have for humanity. It doesn't matter if they're rich or poor, <coughs> if they're powerful or if they're weak. <clears throat> you know, God loves them all. And that's something that, that um, I love about our little church. Now, some might come and they might stay a while and they might say, well, there's not so much love here. And I can see <clears throat> someone saying that because in their heart, what they're saying is, <clears throat> I don't like the way they do things here. <clears throat> they ought to be doing them the way I think they should be done. And so <clears throat> I don't feel the love. And that's what they're saying. <clears throat> but if they were just to stand back and, and start loving as we truly are loving, you know, as we truly are loving, when you see people coming in here in wheelchairs without legs to get food and we give them food without judging them, <clears throat> loving them, when we give up our spot or our place so that someone else could have it, that's loving them. Uh, when we set up the, this place so that people can come in and enjoy themselves and feel comfortable and, and get what they need, that's loving them. <clears throat> it's a very, very loving place. And that love is only there because of Jesus Christ <clears throat> and nothing else. <clears throat> it wouldn't be us. And in fact, if, if, if we try to love, we'd probably fail at it. And so what we need to do is we need to allow God to love through us. That's the only way that we can have true love for, for people. Look what he says in verse 17. Therefore, all of this, in all things, he, that is Jesus, had to be made like his brethren, 
that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God. Is Jesus merciful and faithful? Yes. You better believe it. Totally. <laughs> I would have been fried a long time ago. Amen. Toast, as they would say, a long time ago. But he has been very merciful to me and very, very faithful. And he's the high priest. Now here comes the usage of the verbiage in the Old Testament, in the Le Leviticus and Numbers, the high priest, the Levitical tribe, Aaron being the high priest. And Jesus is replacing Aaron as the ultimate perfect high priest here. One is, is merciful and faithful. Was Aaron faithful? No. Remember when he came up against Moses and God had to you know, take him out to the, to the bush there and take a, a switch and just give him a little beating there you know, to correct him, right? Thank God for that because he was corrected. And we'll see tonight that God is faithful too. Even though Aaron wasn't faithful, God was faithful to him because there's a, there's a <coughs> battle for Aaron's position <coughs> as a high priest. And so God has to let the children of Israel know who the person I chose, and that was Aaron, the budding of Aaron's um, staff. So he's faithful and he is merciful, very merciful as a high priest. And then he goes on, in things pertaining to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. What's the word propitiation? What does that mean? It's, it's, a, <coughs> it's a sin offering. He's a, and instead <coughs> of, he's the, the covering. He's the total, not just the covering, but he t his whole thing is, he did it, now you're forgiven. <coughs> right. He's propitiation means a sacrifice that appeases a God. Mm. Mm. Right. And so God's anger has been appeased. Uh, my license plate on my vehicle says my wrath. And so I always, whenever I do get an opportunity where someone says, hey, that's a cool license plate. So I'll explain to them. Well, <clears throat> see, God's wrath is on mankind. And unless you receive Jesus Christ, uh, his wrath will continue to be on you. See, Jesus is the propitiation. He is the sacrifice uh, that God has required that it would remove the wrath of God. That's what propitiation means. So he was the ultimate sacrifice. For in that he himself has suffered. Being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. <clears throat> so you know what? I might not understand you. I might not know how you're feeling, but Jesus does. Others may misunderstand you, <clears throat> not know your heart, but Jesus does. People may see your sin, and it may be pretty bad. That Jesus sees it too, but he has mercy and grace on you. That's the Savior we save. And that's the Savior that, that all mankind should serve. So, we have an opportunity today to just thank Jesus for what he's done for us. Let's pray. <clears throat> Gracious Father, thank you, Lord, for your precious Son. <clears throat> Lord, may, may his name be lifted up, Father, in this church, in this ministry, and in our lives, Lord. Today, may we glorify the name of Jesus, the name above all other names, Lord, the name where men can be saved if they call out on the name of Jesus Christ, Lord. We lift him up, Father. He is the preeminence, Lord. <clears throat> he is above all things. He is our judge, and yet, Lord, he is faithful and merciful to every one of us, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for that truth. May we walk in joy and in rest and in peace today, knowing that Jesus loves us and that we do have a high priest that's been tempted in every point and that he does understand our infirmities and our pain and our doubts, our worries, <clears throat> even our unbeliefs, Lord. And even the feelings that we get of failure, Lord, because we don't measure up uh, to Christ. Just as Paul said, boy, the things that I don't want to do, I find myself doing. God, help me, what a wretched man that I am. And then the realization in <clears throat> Romans chapter 8, verse 1, thank God that there's no condemnation. No, no, none whatsoever of those in Christ Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. May we walk in that place. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for joining us. If you have any prayer requests, please post them and we will pray for you. Have a wonderful day. If you have no church and you'd love to find a church, come join us at 5383 Martin Street in Harupa Valley. We will be here tonight at 7 p.m. And we will worship the Lord and get into his word in Numbers chapter 17. Have a wonderful day.